Welcome again. And today we're going to be talking about uh, a process and a procedure uh, when uh, can, that that's, you can follow when engaging a violent risk assessment. Now you'll note that the image I have is of youth violent risk assessment. And when we were uh, talking about putting this together, uh, initially we thought we would try to do something that was broad and comprehensive but um, have really kind of pulled into focusing on the youth, uh, uh, at least initially. A couple of reasons for this. One is, is that um, the uh, most likely the typical uh, practicing psychologists or school psychologists are, are going to be uh, asked to do these types of assessments um, uh, in, in, out, out in the uh, treatment community. Uh, there are specialists that do also do adult risk assessments, and um, and particularly, you know, the FBI is one organization that really recommends that if you are seriously concerned about an adult uh, having uh, violence risk potential, that they become engaged and uh, really discourage the practicing community from just generally doing this. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't and that the expertise in that area is not something that uh, you can develop or pursue. Uh, but we're going to focus today on the youth component of it. Now, I will say that many of the aspects of youth developing uh, violence risk behaviors does have relevance also in uh, young adults and adults. Um, but the window we're talking about is going to be more focused on uh, the younger folks. So today's goal is that you will, as participants, be introduced to a structured methodology in assessing risk factors for determining uh, legitimate risk for violent behavior with an emphasis on youth who are at risk, as I noted. While adults are also uh, do clearly engage in violent behavior, Violence does typically have it, have its roots in childhood, early adolescence, and through adolescence, and can be influenced by a multitude of factors that really set the stage for violence in both youth, youth and then later adulthood. So we will discuss these factors and then how to use an assessment strategy to determine a continuum of risk. Several of our tools will also be discussed uh, as we go through the uh, the training uh, to really demonstrate how to identify psychological risk factors that can help inform really your violence risk evaluation overall. Oops, my screen here. Um, hope you can see these okay. Uh, pause my screen advancing. I can't really tell. Okay. So, uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, so who am I? <laughs> so I am a psychologist, a clinical psychologist, and um, I was also trained as a school psychologist. I bring to this uh, presentation over 30 years of experience in both clinical and school settings. My uh, clinical focus has included uh, over the, the, the prior decades working with uh, high risk youth in community based prevention and intervention programs as well as mental health care, both outpatient and uh, residential care, uh, working with adjudicated youth in a variety of different community-based programs. And then as a part of that, really uh, working with uh, a variety of entities, including uh, federal funding agencies, state, county, city, uh, various task forces to, impl to, to implement or develop and implement best practice treatment models. Uh, some of these functional family therapy. Uh, we were one of the, I think, the first program to introduce it to Oregon at the time, as well as partnering with uh, other entities to implement multi-systemic therapy in, in, our, in our component of that as a treatment ag agency. Also integrating dual diagnosis treatment for mental health and substance use uh, disorders through typically through con county uh, contracts and as well as with uh, a CSAT, uh, which is the Center for um, substance abuse treatment and some NCSAP, which is the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, as well as gain transition programs for adjudicated youth who are exiting the Oregon uh, State Authority, uh, as well as developing uh, the first youth drug courts in the state of Oregon. And then, as I noted, just working with multiple entities that were invested in helping youth succeed and thrive. So currently, I work with Pearson, and I'm the director of the Western Region and our government uh, programs within Pearson Clinical Assessment. 
So I want to call out a, a special thanks to uh, a retired psychologist out of Oregon whose uh, name is Dr. Eric Johnson. And Eric Johnson was the, um, really, this is his brainchild, and that he, he was the owner of the uh, Oregon Forensic Institute. And so this presentation today is based on the violence risk assessment methodology that was compiled by Dr. Johnson when he was in practice uh, from the Oregon Forensic Institute. Now, this is a structured approach to evaluating violence risk in youth. And uh, Dr. Johnson has given me permission for reproduction and dissemination of his strategic approach to assessing violence in youth. Uh, to quote Dr. Johnson, he expressed his appreciation that his work continues to be shared and hopes others find it beneficial. As he said, I'm glad that old boy risk assessment has still got some life in it. So a little more regarding who <coughs> Dr. Johnson is, is uh, some of you may recall that back in the 90s, it was uh, in uh, southern, in actually central Oregon, uh, just outside of Eugene, there was a, a young man named Kip Kinkle who um, who murdered his parents and then proceeded to go to the high school where he was attending and shoot a number of, of uh, his peers there, some of whom died, some of whom uh, remained uh, with life uh, long injuries. And the irony is, is that Kip Kinkle was on the radar uh, and a child of concern, and Dr. Johnson was actually scheduled to be doing an evaluation with him um, uh, before he went ahead and uh, engaged in his behaviors. Um, subsequently, Dr. Johnson became uh, the state's witness uh, in um, basically the issues and risks that led up to Kip Kinkle's actions and activities. And so, um, so he, you know, following that, um, clearly he, he was already an expert in uh, risk assessment for um, individuals, but um, he continued on in that endeavor until his retirement um, training professionals throughout our community. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, the goal is for us to review what we describe as risk factor domains. And there are uh, the seven broad domains that we're going to be hitting on. Okay. Uh, then after we walk through these, and it's pretty comprehensive, is that we will try to then synthesize how we pull these together to inform our recommendations. And like many things in life, there's not a static threshold that you can say, okay, once we've crossed it, voila, we have our answers. That behavior, as we know, is a dynamic process. And so part of this strategy and this approach is really how do we dip into this, this um dynamic phenomenon of, of uh, evolving risk, developing risk, and, and make some kind of determination of the probability or the likelihood that this will indeed continue to escalate to potential violence. Or is it de-escalating? And across these domains, we're going to look at how do we how do we assess that, basically? So some, are, some of these domains will be more uh, critical and some less so. And then, uh, then pulling those together and concluding what our violence risk assessment is, and then how do we proceed from uh, that point to make recommendations uh, as far as who's to get, who to get involved, uh, kind of systems to engage, and, and so on. So hopefully that this uh, general outline will be something that you can use with some sense, uh, a level of confidence uh, in your decision-making process. So the challenge, what is this challenge for us, is that predicting violence, as you know, is difficult to do. And by and large, the, the, uh, the best predictor of later violence is prior violence, okay? So, in fact, the, uh, the best risk factors, the best that we can do is look at risk factors that increase the probability of the use of violence as a mechanism of, of either coping with their life or their situation or their emotions or frustrations uh, as a mechanism for control, maybe control um, perhaps themselves, but more often external entities or, or persons uh, as a mechanism for avoidance, uh, accountability, responsibility, escape, and possibly even retribution, depending on the nature of their, uh, their, their sense of being wronged and the personality makeup and, and some other factors, which I'll hit on a little bit later. So ultimately, these, uh, these factors, risk factors, which are both internal and external, do or can potentially lead up to the culmination of a violent action or actions against others. So we will look at, at these factors and synthesize them in an effort to establish the likelihood of future violent action. So that's our goal today. Hey, Pat, 
A question yeah. that's been asked that could you turn more light on? They can't see you very well. Oh, uh, actually, I'm, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that's, my, that's my situation. I'm sorry, guys. I'm not the, the face isn't important. It's the content. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, so let's begin. So um, I mentioned that there's going to be a series of domains. And so we're going to call these risk factor domains. And as we walk through each of these domains, as you see, is that uh, we have basically a, a, a small Likert or a polytomist scoring scale that we use, where zero is, oops, I should have two here, not three. Um, zero is not true. One is somewhat true, and this should be two there. And true is, is very, um, very, three is right there. Is, is the wrong number, which I have two there, is very true, okay? So when we talk about risk factors, these are actually empirically validated uh, risk factors from so, you know, studies that have gone on prior. Uh, many of these you can find through certain resources and clearinghouse resources, such as the Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency Programs, OJJDP. <laughs> Excuse me. It gives you links to uh, um, scholarly articles uh, as well as scholarly programs on identifying uh, youth at risk for a variety of criminogenic activities as well as some of the, the best practice programs that have been designed to um, uh, ad address those behaviors and risks. So as we dive in, so under this, uh, a child's or adolescence, pre-adolescence individual risk factors is the most important is what are those youth violence risk factors? And so we know from the literature that early behavior problems that start before age 10 um, is, is a key indicator. And, and in fact, when we think about you know, people who eventually get diagnosed with, uh, with conduct, uh, excuse me, uh, antisocial personality disorder, is they have to really march through a sequence of diagnostic classifications that are increasingly escalated and um, in the disruption that the child is experiencing in their own regulation, as well as the impact that they're having on their environmental regulation, on uh, their environment. So, so often we'll see, we'll have kids who may have ADHD, who maybe it's poorly regulated ADHD, that they evolve and emerge into oppositional defiant disorder as they get older. Eventually, that has continued to uh, progress in a poorly regulated manner for a variety of reasons. And, and those children may eventually become more criminally engaged and uh, qualify for getting a conduct disorder. And once that stage has really been established, and this is prior to becoming... Uh, adults, legal adults, uh, that once those thresholds have been um, really uh, hit, that if the, the young adult now continues to engage in similar types of behavior, they may end up being eventually diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. So we really see that progression. And um, so part of that also is this real struggle with uh, managing anger or poor frustration tolerance that very quickly escalates. And so we, we, we see this in this regulation problem, whether it's reactive or instrumental, it really doesn't matter because they can both end up in, vo of, um, in violence. What does matter over time is what type of psychological makeup really contributes to the instrumental use of anger. And, and instrumental is I'm going to hurt this person because I want a specific outcome versus I'm going to hit this person to defend myself because they're pushing my button so hard and I can't handle it anymore. So there's two, which is more of a reactive type anger. Also, the tendency to in, to have a high level of uh, tolerance, but a uh, eagerness even for risk taking behavior. So these would be the the risk taking behaviors you, you might see consistent with substance use, uh, you know, uh, willingness to break the law or violate con uh, typical social norms such as like trespassing or uh, property damage, these kinds of things that um, they start young, maybe starting fires or a variety of different things where, you know, when you get in trouble, it's not a little, little deal. It's a big deal. So kind of an increasing level of tolerance and socialization for the uh, kind of internalized acceptance or appropriateness of risk-taking behavior. Okay. Oops. Right down here. So... So under that same uh, kind of first domain of not true, somewhat true, and very true, is we're going to talk about how these individual, while well, we talked about the kind of empirically based risk factors, there are also what we describe as youth disturbance risk factors. Now, we say that 
these are pathways to violence. The reason that we say this is that these are studies that may be out there. They are um, there are correlational uh, uh, impacts that behavior the child has that are associated with violence, but they aren't as as firmly ensconced in the literature as predictive as some of the, as the risk factors themselves. Yet they contribute to the pathway that may, eventually may erupt or emerge as violent behavior. So, for example. Um, you would score the, the child uh, with a zero, one, or two along each of these uh, uh, items, uh, where it's not, it's, not, it's not a risk factor or it's somewhat true, or this is a very, very true risk factor. So the first is victim of bullying. Okay? And then, for example, in the case of the Kip Kinkle uh, uh, scenario that played out is that that young man was unfortunately uh, very rejected by his peers throughout much of his life. He had early behavior problems and behavior regulations problems, okay? Well, he may not have been a direct victim of violence uh, that we know of, uh, from, at least it's from his family he wasn't. Um, he may have had a component of that as a part of his bullying. But being a victim of violence that actually is a potential stage, particularly for reactive aggression, if you feel like you have to defend yourself. So the child who is constantly bullied and then comes to school with a knife or a gun, because they're really fearful for their life, may end up becoming um, uh, a reactive type of scenario for that child defending themselves. Lack of regard for others. And, and this risk factor, and lack of remorse, okay, uh, as these two risk factors together, they are beginning to also suggest it's kind of the emergence or the maybe the presence that's already there of what we, what we describe as criminogenic thinking styles or thought patterns, which I'll talk more a bit about later when we talk about uh, the hair psychopathy index. But when you have these types of removal and disregard for really the experience or the or, or lack of empathic kind of internalization of someone else's experience or suffering, that is a pathway, a uh, risk factor. Having central uh, central nervous system damage, so you know, perhaps close, close head injuries from falls or these types of things, um, can also add some um, uh, risk uh, because some of the inhibitory functions may be impaired by some of those injuries, brain injuries, and then having low intelligence. And you know, unfortunately, we've seen this uh, consistently, particularly when you look at adult incarceration rates and how many what rep of that sample or representative of that sample have uh, kind of kind of marginal or, or lower uh, IQ scores um, and how really it contributes to almost like a lack, a lack of flexibility in being able to problem solve or, or tie together consequential thinking. Like if I do this, then this will happen. Okay. Um, so these combined, you know, the more of these that you have, particularly if they are somewhat to very true, uh, are increasing the likelihood of that march towards potential violence as an individual risk factor. So then, as an evaluator, what you can do is you, you, know, you, 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 you code this basically with your one, zero, one, or two, and then you make a estimation. Of, is this a pattern that is escalating, which is going to be more of a concern for us? Is it de-escalating? So maybe these are issues in the past, but there's been some interventions that are going on, so you're actually seeing this go down. Or you knew the child had behaviors in the past that were risk factors, but that's, they seem to be de-escalating. And by the way, this is across both the, um, the pathways to violence as, as well as the individual uh, empirically based risk factors, okay? Empirically directed risk factors. Or is there no change? Is this individual stable at this time um, and they're not going up or down? So, uh, so if it's already, so if you have a child that has a high level of individual risk factors uh, and the youth disturbance risk factors, and, uh, and you're not seeing a change where de-escalation would actually be ideal, this, even though you say no change, it can still be uh, a red flag, okay? And obviously escalation is something that we would consider a red flag as well. So under the, uh, the, uh, the, the risk factor domain under part B, we talk about now family risk factors, okay? Now again, these are empirically based uh, links. So. Uh, that, that contribute to youth violence risk factors that have uh, that come from the family domain of risks. First is a family marital uh, or, or severe family strife, marital strife. And, you know, we have domestic violence right below there. And this is often 
this often co-occurs where you have high conflict families where you know solutions and problem solving at the end of the day or maybe even before the end of the day um, involve levels of um, threat of violence or violence and often just living with the threat of violence which is a part of high high uh, family strife is is often more stressful than, than even the act of violence itself which for many they say gives them some sense of kind of uh, immediate resolution so you can kind of part ways after that but violence in general high levels of strife is a uh, established risk factor Furthermore, often we'll see that families, particularly criminogenic families or families that have criminogenic uh, attitudes and values, don't limit their conflicts to their family. They, we will also see that they have aggression in the community. Some of these may be gang related. They may not necessarily be gang related, but uh, we often see criminality as a as a component of a family's constellation and that, you know, the family endorses aggression and violence as a mode of problem solving. Man up, maybe might be the attitude, deal with your problems, okay? Uh, where the parents themselves may, in, in fact, have um, be antisocial. They may indeed even have some of their own criminal history, where they've been incarcerated, uh, or they have been uh, part of uh, gang situations. And so they have their own established pattern of uh, criminogenic attitudes, thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors. And then uh, uh, sibling delinquency. So we will often see that uh, you know families will have multiple children who end up getting involved in the law. Okay? Uh, additionally, uh, poor parenting practices. So, so for example, either you know you have the highly lax parenting practices where the children are very poorly supervised and and uh you know if you ask the child you know pre-adolescent where are your parents they might say well what's that right um or you maybe have overly authoritarian and restrictive parenting practices where the children are not uh, really encouraged to do problem solving and think through uh challenges and uh, to do as i say Parent child separation and be with uh, kids, particularly if they've been pulled out of the home and they've been put into the child protective system, but that ended up not being very stable for them as well. So that they end up bouncing around from location to location. And this has a real impact on, um, on attachment, as we know, and some of the ripple effects from, from attachment injuries that don't really get uh, addressed well early on uh, and that continue to escalate. And then uh, as a part of that maltreatment, child maltreatment, uh, neglect and, uh, and, and indeed physical abuse as well. And then and in poverty. Now, poverty is a very broad risk factor, okay? But poverty often entails being exposed to some of the community disillusion, illusion, uh, whether the family's not immediately engaged with themselves. The ch people who grow up in poverty situations have higher rates of exposure to uh, community-based violence, uh, substance use, uh, peers of other family members that are, have uh, experience of incarceration um, and, and so on and so on, as we all know. <clears throat> then, um, so those were the, so as you know, as you can see, there are a lot of uh, established risk factors, okay, for uh, familial uh, roads to violence. Um, but then uh, for the youth disturbance risk factors, what we find is that uh, if you build in family substance abuse, uh, as well as family mental illness and the child having a history of running away, that while these aren't as robustly linked to imminent violence, that they are contributing factors. Okay, um, so and often family substance use leads to uh, child substance use, which becomes a risk factor of its own accord. So again. Uh, after evaluating all of these risk factors and disturbance risk factors on a score of zero, one, or two, uh, you would you would estimate uh, is this an escalation of concern, a de-escalation, or a stable concern? And when I do my write-ups, I will I will go through each of these factors and 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 indicate my coding, and then use the the language of this is an es escalating pattern to, uh, to be considered for future intervention um, planning. So then the third uh, uh, broad domain uh, in the risk factor domain is the peer community risk factors, okay? So the youth violence risk factors, which empirically validated uh, um, 
components include peer, poor peer relationships, and particularly if you see youth who who we might describe as unpopular. And uh, you know, we know from Kip Kinkle, we know from the Columbine youth that this was the youth that shot the um, Columbine High School is that this was a. Uh, a very consistent finding and with them as well as others who have engaged in these types of behaviors um, to the harm of others is that they tend to not have a really good, uh, a well-developed uh, peer network or relationship system. And that often will actually gravitate towards others who have some of the same sense of lack of popularity and acceptance in their, in their peer groups. Also, if they associate with delinquent peers, and you know, I can't tell you how many times over the years when I've worked with kids is that they were fine, they were fine, and then they would meet a you know, specific group of peers or a particular peer who really endorsed risk-taking and delinquency, and then that would become kind of the avenue into which they would start doing some of their own activities themselves. Now, clearly, they make decisions to cross those lines and thresholds, but having a social group that endorses uh, these types of behavior patterns, and particularly if they endorse criminogenic thinking and attitudes, becomes a real risk factor for them. Uh, availability of firearms um, is uh, clearly a risk factor, as we know. And then also being around peers and adults who endorse violence, we, we know is a risk factor. And uh, as another example, you know, the case uh, with Kip Kinkle is, is one of the, the efforts that his family made to really try to help him feel engaged and included and pursue interests that he liked was he had, a, he had an interest in weapons and firearms. And uh, so by the time he eventually ended up shooting his parents and then going off to, um, um, to, to harm the kids at the school, I think he had upward, uh, upwards of uh, perhaps 20 different types of uh, firearms and uh, you know, knives and whatnot um, uh, that his parents, in an effort to try to, to connect with him, uh, continued to give him, which ended up unfortunately being their demise and others. Uh, all right. So, uh, so then, uh, so then, youth disturbance risk factors as a pathway to violence is when we when we, uh, we see that that if a, a, an adolescent or a child has has peers that have been the victim of violence, particularly if they're associated with uh, gang affiliated or or, or a maybe jumped in, formally jumped in, but sometimes they'll have friends that are part of that, that network and um, and they get exposed to violence. So there's a sense of retribution that comes into play here. Also, peers use and endorsement of weapons and access to weapons. And as I mentioned, peers in, in gangs and uh, gang activity where uh, violence is uh, one of the factors that is often requ it is required typically in order to become a full a member of a gang. And often kids that end up not doing that, this is, this is one of the thresholds that they choose not to cross in getting what we describe as being jumped into a gang or having to to go through the, the required uh, expectations in order to demonstrate their willingness to take risks, to be violent, to support the gang values and ethos and so on. So again, uh, based on how you rate a zero, one, or two with uh, not true, somewhat true, or very true, you consolidate these in your overall estimation of the peer community risk factors as escalating, de-escalating, and stable. And then you go on to the next one which is still under the kind of main risk factor domain, okay? And, and you'll know there's not a disturbance risk factor in this. These are just the, uh, the, the empirically validated um, ones that we're gonna be talking about for this particular school risk factor domain. So youth violence risk factors in the school domain include uh, truancy and skipping school, escalating, escalating behaviors of truancy and skipping school. You know, why is this significant? Well, one is, is that it shows that often is, is because the, the child has an experience of really not feeling like school is their thing. They don't feel connected to school, whether it's through their peers, uh, or they don't feel connected to the uh, academics who are teaching them in school, or the teachers, rather. Uh, and so, you know, for most of us in our society, going to school is a very well-established social norm that our communities embrace, our families embrace. And so when kids really begin to, to skip and be truant, they're usually truant for reasons, uh, uh, often for reasons that involve uh, risk-taking activities or, or just really trying to uh, uh, moderate some of their own emotional world, and school is not a good place for them to do that. So avoidance of, of that's a part, uh, part of their metric. Um, having frequent discipline problems in school. So you will often see that these kids have, have a very close relationship with the principal and vice principal and those who are involved with having to hold their behavior ac 
accountable. They may often be sent to the behavior classrooms, whether it's a part of an IEP or not, uh, to basically develop sub sub special ed types of interventions to keep um, um, to to work with kids that are having some of these behavior issues and keep them from disrupting some of their peer, uh, even though they're not on IEPs. Often, and then you will also see that you have attitudes of, of low commitment to school, so they don't really see the value of it. They'll tell you school sucks, it's boring, these kinds of things. And then uh, consequently, they are because of the lack of investment engagement in school, or perhaps even because they have legitimate learning problems, uh, you know, they go to school and they experience failure repeatedly. Okay? So if you, you can begin to get a sense that if these risk factors begin to stack upon each other, with the individual risk factors, they have poor peer relationships, family risk factors, of high conflicts in the family, and they go to school and they have to spend most of their day in school experiencing these poor peer relationships, not really feeling connected to their teachers. It's not a place that they really want to spend a lot of time. And so, again, you would uh, rate this zero, one, or two as uh, not true, somewhat true, or very true, and then uh, rank your um, escalation level. Okay? Is it escalating, de escalating? Is it stable, or does it not really apply? What that is really getting to is. Sometimes for some kids, school is actually, it's, it's an oasis, as it were. It's a safe haven. And so even though they may have problems in the individual and family risk factors and community risk factors, schools can be a good place for them, particularly if those schools have taken aggressive steps to implementing uh, kind of social support types of programs and systems for high-risk kids. Okay. And while I don't have a slide in here, uh, you know, we are talking about risk factors today. What we are not talking about are protective factors. And, um, uh, and I would uh, encourage folks to search, see, uh, seek out uh, information that's available through the Search Institute. It's been around for decades on risk and protective factors. Uh, it goes a little bit beyond what we're talking about today because they're more broad. These are really geared towards violence risk factors. Uh, but protective factors of which school affiliation and identifying with uh, having positive attitudes towards teachers is one of those risk uh, protective factors. So, so then when we talk about mental health risk factors for the uh, child, okay? So the youth violence risk factors that's consistently linked in the literature is having kind of hyperactivity, impulsive, inattentive um, uh, behavioral or cognitive uh, uh, makeup. So now I always caution folks, being hyperactive does not mean you're going to be violent, okay? But when we look at those who eventually do engage in uh, violent behavior is that this component is uh, very often um, a part of their background makeup, okay? So, you know, being impulsive in and of itself, okay, that can cause issues, particularly, you know, if you'd like to have risk taking on top of it, right? And if you like substance use and these kinds of things, uh, that, that impulsive behavior can really get uh, folks in situations where extricating themselves may end up resulting in a violent activity to get out of a situation. Also, this idea of inattentiveness, you know, we, we really try to tend to um, this, this um, kind of the executive functioning component. And, and, um, and when you look at some of the neuropsych testing that we uh, with, with, with our youth is that we will often find that this higher order executive functioning factors do seem to play a role in later conduct problems and, by, and uh, aggressive behavior. So just to give you some examples, uh, you, know, uh, pe you know, people who struggle with uh, executive functioning, they can have more problems with uh, cognitive flexibility. So that means if they, you know, get kind of stuck in a rut with their attitude or opinion about something. It's hard for them to really be able to step out of that 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 box and consider alternative perspectives. Okay, alternative data, really, even before perspectives are formed. Another interesting observation, and this is something that we've like seen with with the NEPSI tests, for example, is is that uh, kids who who have been identified with having conduct problems often will have difficulty recognizing facial expressions accurately. Um, they have more errors with that. So why is this significant? Well, you know, if, if a child thinks that you're angry at them and that's the impact in their internal processing system that sticks with them, and then later on you try to process something with them, but you're not angry, you're not, you're not scowling, you're not expressing, you're not raising your voice. Many youth have a hard time being able to shift over to see the new 
affective response. And um, so there's these, there's these, uh, these inattentive uh, kind of uh, ADD, ADHD factors that um, can really compound and comprise uh, some, some problems um, regarding violence eventually happening. So then under youth disturbance risk factors and pathways to violence, uh, some of the more overt and frank um, psychological problems, which, uh, you know, if a child has uh, a paranoid attitude or kind of a, a way of processing the world, particularly if they see themselves as being victimized a lot, whether it is happening or not, um, can be a contributing factor. Now, this is, you know, if someone's coming from a highly violent home um, where, and they're also having uh, violent exposure to peers and they're getting bullied, uh, you know, sometimes paranoid doesn't mean you're not out to get you, right? And so, uh, but if you see this and you see this as kind of a filter uh, across their worldview, that's going to be a potential uh, pathway as well. Uh, Self-defense, really. Uh, hallucinations. So, you know, are they hearing and seeing things? Are they losing some of that? Uh, cognitive and, and uh, kind of that coherent organization of thought to be able to really do adequate reality testing and what they're experiencing, perceiving. And then having what we term criminogenic thinking attitudes. Now, you know, this is a term that you will often see working in the criminal justice industry or side of uh, the field uh, where we, there are certain attitudes and beliefs. There are uh, endorsements of values that really support criminal behavior. Or, or rule breaking or law breaking behaviors. And we, we capture those as criminogenic thinking attitudes. And Hare, who is a psychologist, I believe, out of Canada, has uh, spent uh, his career on really identifying these factors, criminogenic thinking attitudes, uh, particularly as they uh, relate to psychopathy, which is kind of the more extreme, extreme form of, of criminality that uh, really has that lack of empathy and. Um, you know, and, and unfortunately, um, what we know is is that uh, upwards of ninety percent of, of law breaking behavior is conducted by about ten to fifteen percent of the population, and so it's usually the high risk folks that are the, the repeat offenders, um, and and those tend to be the ones that have high levels of criminogenic thinking attitudes that you really do see beginning to emerge um, uh, before adulthood is established, full adulthood. And then still under domain one risk factors is we have mental health risk factors continued uh, as these pathways uh, of depression, suicidal ideation, uh, trauma, particularly complex trauma where children have been exposed to high, highly unstable environments where they're chronically invalidating environments. And, and you know, one of the ways that uh, we develop validation is through seeing the impact that our behavior has on the world and ourselves. And so... Um, um, we will often see that as a component of children who engage in uh, violence later on. And then having bipolar disorder as well. So I think what I'd like to kind of hit on with all of these, these uh, the depression through the bipolar is that we're really seeing the kind of not dysregulated behavior, whether it's internally dysregulated, uh, dysregulated affect behavior, uh, and, and as well as uh, dysregulated external behavior. So uh, bipolar disorder, particularly, you might see some of the kind of impulsivity and, and acting out in ways you may not see it with someone who has depression. But you know, somebody who has, feels like they have nothing left to lose may be at higher risk, for example, engaging in, in an activity that has violence as a potential outcome to it. So again, uh, after you've ranked all of these uh, pathways to violence and, and also the risk factors on the zero to two scale, uh, you would summarize how you overall see this escalation, de-escalation, stable, or it doesn't really apply as perhaps mental health risk factors are not a part of this child's um, immediate makeup. Okay. So then, well, let's talk about, oops, it's a duplicate slide here, I think. Oh, let me see what I got. Oh, okay. So let's, yeah, I'm sorry. I think I got the wrong slide here. So let's, so, so where do we come into play? All right. So we, you know, when we talk about mental health risk factors, we, you know, often we'll interview, we'll get some historical information, but it's also helpful to have, uh, um, uh, objective materials that you can use as confirmation of uh, engagement of child or adolescent and uh, what, they're, what they're experiencing as well as what others are observing. Um, and so what, um, we have kind of a hierarchy of tests here. The first I'm going to talk about is the, the BASC. Okay. Let me see. What is that here? Uh-oh. Hey, Sherry, I think you might have the wrong slide here. Uh-oh. Oh, heck. I think... 
I think I gave you the wrong one. Is there a way to share my screen? Uh, well, all right, let me just talk about this real quickly. Um, so, you know, if, if you're not familiar with the Behavioral Assessment System for Children, it's the BAS-3. It's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's, a, uh, it's a clinical rating scale, and it's a comprehensive clinical rating scale that measures a variety of factors, uh, including um, um, depression and uh, anxiety, as well as hyperactivity, uh, uh, ADD specifically as well. Uh, and it also has some um, what we might describe as protective factors, as it were, um, or uh, factors that um, are behavioral assets for the child, strengths. Um, and so uh, these would be things like capacity for peer engagement, um, sort of nest and these types of things. Uh, the MPIA, or F, is, um, sorry, sorry folks, I see if I can pull my data up for you and share it. Um, so the MAPI ARF is based on the MAPI, uh, original MAPI, uh, and then which was converted to an adolescent version as the MAPI A, and um, most recently has been uh, re-released as the MAPI restructured format, which is a it's a test of personality and uh, psychopathology that has been around for quite some time. Uh, the Milan, the Milans, we have several Milans, and and and, and then the Milans are. Uh, are tests that you typically historically would not just give to somebody right out of the gate. You would give it to them uh, when you really suspected there is the existence of some psychopathology and um, some problems that uh, that um, uh, you, you want. You, you really need to address more specifically. The nice thing about the Milan inventories is that they give you some um, uh, intervention uh, structure around which you can do your intervention planning and then really track change over time. Um, so for adolescents, you would use the MACI. For younger folks, you would use the MPACI, uh, which is the pre-adolescent clinical inventory. And then uh, I put in here the hair psychopathy or the hair PCL for youth version. Uh, so you know the hair psychopathy index is, in essence, is a structured way of looking at uh, both interviewing the uh, individual as well as uh, talking about um, or with um, individuals who interact in that uh, person's life, as well as looking at historical uh, data records, criminal records, and these types of things to establish really the risk of, of future violence. And it's a highly predictive methodology to use. Excuse me. I like to hear also because it really informs us about some of the criminogenic attitudes, thoughts, and behaviors that um, that children have. Um, so I. Okay. Yeah, I think I gave you, um, you know what, I had a slides of, of some um, protocol I put in here, and I think I sent the wrong one to our meeting uh, host, as I'm seeing some of these here. So um, I will provide those uh, to the host so that when you get your printout, you will have those. Um, unfortunately, there, I don't think there's a way for me to share my screen to show that to you. So uh, my mistake, folks, I am terribly sorry about that. So anyways, I will then continue on in our format, um, um, but before I do that, I, I will just say that uh, typically what I will do if I'm doing uh, the risk evaluation is I will include a battery of tests of which the BASC is one, okay, and then the MMPI and, and the Milan, uh, given the appropriate age uh, who, for the child, the child or the adult, um, I, I, would, um, I would give them as well. And I would really specifically hone in on areas of, um, uh, of aggressiveness. I would hone in on the diagnostic areas around attention deficit and hyperactivity. Um, and, and I would um, hone in on areas where there's suggestion of uh, or indication of uh, behavioral or a characterological dysregulation um, with uh, the, the youth or whoever, whoever I'm examining. Okay, because these do end up kind of forming risk factors of the person's capacity to really manage themselves uh, and, and regulate their uh, their behavior in an appropriate manner, and becomes a risk factor later on. So you know, if someone is dysregulated and they very quickly go from frustration to aggression, that's going to be a higher risk factor than somebody who is maybe more inter internally dysregulated and may feel an anx anxious or and or depressed. But that may not um, escalate into something that um, is necessarily indicative of 
uh, externalizing behavior. And so uh, the MEPIs in, um, in the Milan um, give you some really good data regarding that. Uh, the hair psychopathy checklist, what it is uh, good for is, as I mentioned, tapping into some of those criminogenic behaviors. And these are things um, um, that are both internal and external. So, for example, some uh, of the attitudinal risk factors would be kind of a sense of glibness. So, uh, you know, there was a, a, a youth I had uh, assessed some time ago that uh, had made threats to a young girl on a, on a bus, okay? And, um, and in the course of my evaluation, you know, his response was, what, well, what big, that wasn't a big deal. It was no big deal just because I was threatening to, you know, to kill her. Uh, and it had really no insight into how inappropriate that was. So, or, you know, Glenn would be, yeah, you know, they, 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 they might be, uh, someone makes a bigger deal out of it. Uh, using um, kind, of, kind of the sense of lack of empathy of the other person's experience is a component of that. Uh, using anger in an instrumental manner. So you are you're using anger to get something done very purposefully, okay? And so on and so on. So, um, again, I will uh, provide those uh, so you can have, you can look at those later on. So. Boy, oh boy, sorry I did that. All right, so um, so as you see, we're still under the main risk factor domain. So, you know, uh, that are um, um, components of this. So we build this on top of concerns. And, and this would be, uh, you know, weapons risk factors. So known uh, established uh, in the literature risk factors include how uh, to use weapons on others. Okay? Now, this can go, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a formal weapon. Uh, a young child uh, that I was uh, working with when I was in the schools uh, creatively would use sharpened pencils to stab his peers in order to just harass them and, uh, and, and laugh about it. Okay? So this was you know, an early use of, of a weaponized uh, pencil, basically. Um, but clearly, if you're, you're, they're using weapons uh, like uh, knives or guns or other bats or whatever to uh, harm other people, that's going to be a clear risk factor. But then pathways to violence include really an obsession or unusual interest in weapons at a, at a, at a young age. And they may carry a weapon such as a knife, gun, a billy club, um, or whatever, brass knuckles uh, on, on their body or in their bag. Okay? And they, they brought these to school. And they have ongoing access to weapons, whether it's through family or peers or whatnot. And then do they have a, this kind of obsessive collection on weapons, like uh, much like Kip Kinkle had? Uh, he had uh, just such a variety of uh, automatic weapons and whatnot that by the time uh, he wanted to use them, he had quite an arsenal in his soul. And then interested in explosives and blowing things up. Okay, which is uh, uh, one of those pathways. So it's this idea of destruction and destruction that may also be brought about by harm um, or direct per person aggression or having the capacity to do that. And again, you would rate that uh, zero uh, to two. Uh, and uh, based on your history and data collection, do you see this as an escalating pattern, de-escalating, no change or stable, or does it not really apply? Are weapons not a factor? All right. And so then once you've kind of walked through uh, these uh, these uh, risk factor domains under the kind of the first domain is uh, what's the, the kind of the locus of focus of potential victims in the home, in the school or in the community? Are we looking at potential victims as being parents? Are they siblings? Are they animals and pets? OK. Um, and then is the frequency of these aggressive acts. So, for example, you know, if the, uh, if the, the child is regularly getting in fights with their siblings and hitting them, you know, and hurting them, and causing bruise and injury, is this a high frequency or a low frequency? And then is the injury caused mild, moderate, or extreme? So clearly, as we go through this grid, you can, deter you can really begin to determine, you know, is most of the problem at home? Do we see this more in the community or perhaps at school? Are we seeing it across the board? And are we seeing the effects of the activity um, having kind of more significant impacts in certain domains, such as home, for example, or school, and maybe less so in other ones? And maybe most of the, maybe most of the problems are occurring in a school environment, not so much outside of uh, in the community, but maybe moderately conflict in, in the home. So you can really begin to cal calibrate uh, where the likely manifestations of these behavior problems have occurred. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So um, 
Okay, so uh, as we continue on with the, uh, uh, once we kind of determine where is this most likely to happen, um, the, uh, the youth violence risk is do they have or do they talk about, do they engage in fantasy about uh, unusual interest in just acting out, not just, you know, video games that we're talking about. We're talking about um, a, a real um, kind of almost obsessive interest in violence, okay? Uh, and then they act it out. Do they actually practice? And, uh, you know, when, when violence usually occurs with kids in, uh, in general, is it doesn't usually just happen. It doesn't just pop. Is that there's this kind of march, this progression towards increasingly uh, approaching the threshold of actions against others. And so it might be engaging in violent fantasies and kind of um, uh, finding value in their conversations with maybe some of them have some of those same values. But then they may begin to experiment with that with, with blowing things up. Blow that. Well, experience uh, more high-risk behaviors by uh, uh, causing harm to s s animals, right? And then maybe they cause harm to bigger animals. Uh, as, as a part of that act towards aggression. And then they may actually do kind of very low-level acts to set people up to be hurt by aggression towards them. Um, and, and then, you know, as they get closer to that threshold, part of what we believe happens is they become more and more desensitized, basically, to the actual act and the risk of, that's, uh, of engaging in that act. Against them. And then um, clearly causing aggression, or aggression really that causes serious injury. So, a fight can be a fight, but a fight that causes real serious injury where someone has, particularly they have to go to the hospital, head injury, there's open wounds. You know, kicking somebody when they're down and repeatedly doing it where, you know, you get rib injuries and head injuries and these type of things, um, you know, that's obviously going to be a clear risk factor for future violence. But then uh, disturbance risk factors along the way is uh, they, they talk about it, they glamorize it. Um, with others, okay? Uh, and maybe they do it online, maybe they do it um, with their friends, and um, maybe they do it, you know, uh, at school. And, uh, and, and they make credible threats. And so, you know, credible threat means that, you know, I'm going, jumping somebody after school could be a credible threat. Um, do they have access to the weapons? Do they have, you know, they have vi prior violations to bring in a knife to school and been suspended for that? Or, or do they have prior expulsions for, for violence? And so kind of a history of prior activity makes future threats credible. Um, and then do they actually make plans to do it? So I'm going to wait till school gets out. And then when Johnny's running by, walking by the, the, the five and dime on the way home, that's when I'm going to get him. Okay. Uh, and then have they made preparations to implement their plan? Uh, have they engaged in kind of animal abuse? Okay. Uh, now animal abuse is not um, one. Uh, you'll notice that it's not a, uh, a under the youth violent risk, but it's a disturbance factor. And um, because it has not been consistently reliably predictive of later violence, but it is a factor in that pathway towards approaching that threshold where it's acceptable to cause harm to innocents. Okay, uh, and then early initiation of violence. So the earlier it starts, is the more problematic it's likely going to be uh, for them. And then, um, uh, and then um, intensity of, of aggression dis display. This is supposed to be display. Sorry for the typo. So you know, what is that aggression? Is it pushing somebody? Is it slugging them with their fist? Pushing might be mild. Slugging them with the fist and the jaw might be moderate taking a bat to them and kicking them in their ribs when they're down in the head would be extreme or you know, using a knife on them or other weapon on them, uh, would be extreme. Okay. Um, so that's the intensity, but then what's the type? Is it predominantly reactive? Is it prom predominantly instrumental? And this can be very informative because if you're really looking at somebody who is engaging in instrumental aggression, then I would really have my red flag up for looking towards uh, trying to assess some of those more, embedded criminogenic attitudes and beliefs about um, uh, 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 beliefs towards others and these kinds of things. Uh, whereas if it's reactive, those, those can be just as dangerous. Uh, and, but they might, they might, um, and they might actually be easier to predict reactive because you can often see the escalation of isolation or ostracization or, you know, uh, mounting conflicts with peers or teachers and family to, uh, to get an idea that, you know, the, this, uh, this, young person is ready to pop. Okay? Instrumental might be more um, insidious. 
and also may be used uh, for a very specific functional purpose, such as uh, joining um, a, a peer group or gang or something along those lines. So again, uh, is this an escalating pattern, de-escalating stable, or does it not apply? Are we not seeing aggression? Okay. Um, so that was the kind of that broad domain we covered a lot of area. Okay. And so by the time we get through that, we should have some beginning to get some general idea of, is this child showing an escalation of behavior across these factors? Are they stable or are they de-escalating? All right. And often with referrals that I would get, um, you know, they would, um, uh, they would um, be worried. Frankly, they would often be more worried that something was going to happen than that likelihood that something all these domains and, and assess kind of that escalating de-escalating stable or does not apply okay because now you have factors that you can lean back against uh, in your uh, consultation and summary of your findings okay but we're not done we have a ways to go still so so then when we talk about synthesizing these findings is we're going to you know, use a variety of resources to confirm or get data. So some of those are going to be school records, and maybe hospital records, or residential treatment records, or criminal justice records. Uh, we're going to get information from teachers. We may involve actually interviewing teachers, particularly if they're a subject of potential threat, uh, receiving the threat, uh, parent guardian information, uh, other family who may be involved with the child who may be reliable sources of information, particularly if the child is not with the parent and guardian and may be living with other family members because of conflicts in the home. Uh, there may be appropriate peer uh, uh, information um, that you may uh, be able to get information from them, perhaps peers that have been treated well or poorly by the, the potential threat. Uh, individual, um, and then other collateral information that may be out there, such as a psychiatric evaluation, uh, is it, um, maybe like I said, PO or, 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 or prevention program counselors or other types of uh, uh, high-risk programs that may be involved in, such as MST or functional family therapy or, or whatnot, okay? Uh, and then from the youth themselves, clearly, the youth being evaluated, the testing that you got from them, uh, as well as the interviews that you've had with them other uh, sources that you think you may need to follow up with because you may be leading down to areas where they, that were missed through the skyline. And then, um, uh, so then summarize uh, the domains of risk, okay? So you wanna check all domains with one or more risk factors. So that, so if it's a zero, you would leave it. If it was a one or two, okay? Uh, then you would go ahead, because we've already marched through this and all the risk factors and then pathways to violence, okay? And you would indicate, is the individual risk factor, do they have mental health problems? So is there MNPI in the Milan saying that they are, um, you know, highly externalizing, that they are high prone to anger, is the Bastion high prone to anger as well? Uh, does the Milan uh, give indications that they have uh, some serious regula regulation problems? And perhaps their, their locus of control is highly externalized, and so all their problems are from others doing things to them, okay? They're pulling these together. Um, so, you know, the more of these that you have checked, uh, the higher the risk is, okay? so. You would go ahead and check them all, or however many that's appropriate. And so the number of domains with risks, let's say seven out of nine, are those that are escalating. So let's say uh, some of those may be de-escalating. Maybe they're getting some family therapy, and that's actually working out pretty well for them. Maybe their health, mental health is being stabilized. So of those seven out of nine, maybe five of them or two of them or three of them are, are actually escalating, okay? Because those are going to be the ones that we're going to really want to hone in on um, for intervention if we need to, okay? So, so then, um, part C under these, the synthesis of findings, uh, critical risks that could be related to imminent violence, okay? So these are important, okay? So check all of these that apply. Do they engage in frequent acts of aggression? Does that aggression cause serious injury? Do they carry a weapon? Have they brought it to school? Have they crossed that important social boundary, okay? Uh, do they talk about it, committing violence? Do they make credible threats? And do they make a plan, okay? And most importantly is what preparation have they made to implement that plan? If you can get access to that information, clearly the more of these that you're going to have checked, the more concerned that we are going to be that the imminent violence is something to take very seriously. Okay. So then, um, so ha after calculating that or establishing kind of your, your take on that is uh, a sec, a part D under the synthesis is summary is, is what's, this, what's your summary of developmental themes? Okay, now these are going to be inferred from inferred from the risk factor domains that we went through earlier. Okay, so have they had disruptive development? Is this something where they've been 
in and out of the home from early on or have part of disruptive development because because their family has had such high levels of of conflict that has resulted in a really inconsistency uh, in in their child rearing maybe the parents have been in and out of jail maybe they've been they have their own significant mental health issues that has kind of had an impact on the child's development uh, has this resulted in poor attachment uh, to primary caregivers, which we know begins to set the stage, you know, the scaffolding for later development? Uh, does the child tend to be self-centered? Okay, do they? Are we seeing the emergence of these kind of early narcissistic attitudes in, 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 the, in the child and uh, adolescent? Do they have a clear or, or established or expressed lack of regard for others? Okay, even though they say they may have regard for others, do they demonstrate that lack of regard? Um, when it's convenient, okay, um, which is which is a uh, one of those com uh, criminogenic components. Uh, do they experience social alienation? Are they a lone wolf? Are they frequently delinquent, delinquent in school and in the community justice system? Um, <clears throat> do they have impaired self-soothing or self-regulation? Are they able to downregulate well or at all? And it, it, uh, do they do it? in a healthy way and an efficient way, or do they smoke a joint and drink beer and try to downregulate that way, which ends up becoming a problem in and of itself, because often those will lead to kind of disinhibited behavior and so on. And um, obviously mental illness, and then uh, which you've uh, established the history as well as some testing uh, that's available. And then this attitude of willingness to hurt others. So do they see others as kind of themselves disengaged enough from others that, that, uh, harm is a viable solution to their problems okay? and then um, are they preoccupied with violence okay so then the the, the third broad uh, category or what kind of situational and contextual variables are at play in this and so um you know what current life stressors are or intensifier variables, we call them, uh, will contribute to this so are we seeing a mounting like we saw with Kiko, for example, we, you know, he, he was failing at school. He was not engaging well with any uh, supportive services or therapies. He was uh, uh, repeatedly tried to get involved in um, various types of sports activities or people tried to involve him in those. And when you look at the history, we just kind of saw this, this cascading uh, litany of failure after failure after failure. So School failure is one of them, okay? Um, he was isolated, you know, peer loss and rejection. Uh, school discipline was becoming an issue uh, for him as well. But we see this with other kids as well, where we have this cascading um, uh, losses and failures and, and conflicts in the school environment, peer rejection and loss, uh, other relationship loss or rejection. This could be through the family member being lost, for example, or other significant compensatory adult. You know, I alluded to earlier the risk and protective factors. One of the key protective factors for kids that are in high-risk situations is having a connection, a healthy connection to an adult that's a non-primary family member. So this could be like a big brother, big sister. Or this could be a, a soccer coach. This could, this could be a youth pastor in their church. Um, it could be you know, uh, uh, their martial arts uh, teacher. Uh, or, or anybody along those lines. So maybe having the loss of one of those types of relationships is a mounting problem. Uh, we've noted family problems is, you know, having high, high intensity families where there's a lot of stress is an intensifier variable. Um, uh, and then having recent family discipline. Okay? So when the family is getting increasingly concerned and frustrated with the child's behavior, misbehavior, begins to clamp down. Uh, and so you'll also see this come up in a variety of different, uh, not only interviews, but through test measures that look at kind of family-child relationship dynamics. You know, the BASC has, uh, has, a, has a mechanism for quantifying that, which is very helpful as well. As well as uh, the MAPI and has uh, attitudes towards family as a component of that as well. And so there's, um, plus your uh, own interview work. So... But family discipline can precipitate is one of the things that could precipitate often reactive aggression. Um, uh, and then death uh, or serious, serious illness of someone they're close to, such as a family member or a friend, uh, for example. And maybe if you're in a gang and a friend gets shot, you know, that might be something that is going to require retribution, for example, uh, in their value set. Uh, and then having their own serious illness and then legal problems, particularly as they continue to mount. Okay. <clears throat> How are we doing here? We got 25 minutes. All right. Um, so, um, are they placed out of the home? Have they been removed from the home, either voluntarily 
um, gone to live somewhere else or are they uh, removed from the home because of involvement, uh, typically in DHS or juvenile justice type systems? Are they a runaway? Are they having a mental health crisis? Have they uh, basically come to the, the end of the line, as it were, for themselves? Are they experiencing acute paranoia or uh, have they been victimized? Are they having uh, significant uh, PTSD type of responses uh, towards any perceived threat of violence by reacting in their own uh, self-defensive manner? Um, are they a victim, of, victim of bullying violence? Have they witnessed trauma in the family uh, or outside of their family, whether it's their peers or just, you know, have they been have they been exposed to something that's been highly unsettling to them so that they become really too up activated and they're not able to down act, down regulate? Okay. or they're upregulated, you say. Uh, other disruptions in their life, other major life changes, so like maybe relocation, moving from um, one, one area of town to another state, another home. Uh, uh, do they have their own substance abuse as well, or are they exposed to it on a regular basis? And have they been uh, a part of pregnancy? Okay, Whether they are themselves pregnant or they have become the father of, uh, uh, of somebody. And uh, that's a that's a significant life stressor, particularly for young young people. So, is this overall pattern escalating, de-escalating, stable, and is there or is there no change? And that this uh, this is unique in this uh, particular uh, domain because now we're asking you to estimate kind of the, the current stress level. Okay, so if it's high and it's stable, or if it's high and continues to escalate, this is going to be a, a significant area of concern in um, uh, the red flag. Um, okay, none of these in isolation, by the way. These are, you can kind of hopefully get a sense, you get a kind of cascading development of risk factors, uh, steps to violence factors, environmental factors, okay? And then what are their coping skills and resources? So in, in regards to these situational and contextual variables, do they have supportive available family? Do they have supportive of available okay? These are, these are for moderator variables, by the way. So can they, if they're getting harassed a lot in school and by peers, do they have a family that understands that? Okay, or does the family just say you need to you need to fight back? You know, here, take this knife, whatever. I, you know, their attitudes about things can really moderate what happens. Do their peers support them? Um, do they have uh, available community supports through uh, you know, community clubs or sports activities or church or whatnot? Okay, um, do, are they able to engage in uh, problem solving skills? Do they have the capacity to step back enough and be mindful enough and then implement really have structured problem solving skills? Or do they see kind of everything as a knee jerk reaction to solve their problems, which violence is a, a very powerful um, mechanism? Um, do they have insight into their own inappropriate behavior? Okay. Do they have appreciation for consequential thinking? Well, this happened because I did this. Yeah. He called me names because I, well, I called him names first and <laughs> I threw a rock at him. Okay. Well, seeing their own link in the consequence of behavior may become a moderating variable because you can then steer them towards other types of uh, uh, mechanisms of, of choice of action. Um, are they willing to seek help? Are they willing to talk to a therapist or a counselor or um, a coach or a, a, a teen advocate? Do they have positive response to interventions in the past when people are available? Okay, uh, Or does it seem to kind of fall on deaf ears? Or does it seem to be um, the assistance of others really get minimized by the, by the, the, the youth? Uh, do they accept supervision? So this is by right, anybody who would be in that capacity, which would be uh, clearly school personnel, as well as obviously family would be really important, but also supervision by potential entities that are in the legal system, for example, or if they're in DHS uh, child protective system, do they, you know, that, that comes with a high level of supervision. Uh, how, does, how do they respond to it? And then for their own behavior, are they willing uh, and engaging if they're really you know, wanting to hurt somebody, are they willing to engage and sign a no harm contract? Now, this is kind of a regular thing that we do um, uh, in, our, in our field where it's no harm to self, no harm to others. Um, it's just one step towards saying we recognize that there is a risk here in taking active ownership in directing oneself away from engaging in that. A contract in and of itself is not a guarantee, as you know, but it is uh, kind of a component of, of, uh, of, a, of a cadre of moderating variables that we would try to expand upon if we can. And then do they have moral or religious beliefs? Like, I, won't, I wouldn't really kill anybody because, you know, it's, um, I don't want to go to hell or whatever their, their value set is, okay? Um, and then um, are there others? 
So coping skills and resources, this is your estimate now, um, uh, does, this, does this child coping skills and resources seem to be adequate to compensate for the potential risks factors that you've gone through um, and community uh, uh, situational factors and stuff like that you've gone through, okay? Or are they inadequate? Are there too few of those moderating protective factors? Uh, and this child is at not only risk because of their own uh, individual familial risk factors and so on, school risk factors, um, but are they, do they have a paucity of, of skills? Are they um, perhaps slower thinkers? Are they not able to be nimble enough to adapt in the situation so that they can default on to healthier options? When the stress is at a peak, does it overwhelm them and flood them so that their options become limited under stress? Okay. So then under the situational contextual variables is where, if something were to happen based on all you've kind of assessed so far, what is the likely context of that aggression and violence? And you check all that apply. School, home, in the community, maybe the community center, I don't know. Um, uh, 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 is it gonna happen in a sporting event perhaps, who knows? Uh, and then what are the conditions? So where it's most likely to happen? In a low structure condition where oversight and supervision is minimal and maybe totally absent, or in, in which case uh, it would probably be less likely reactive and more instrumental type of progression. Or is it in a high structure situation where the child is really coping poor with the demands and expectations for compliance uh, or uh, behaving in a certain manner in which frustration may quickly mount and then violence may end up being more reactive. It could still be instrumental, but more likely you're going to see a, a reactive violence in a high structured situation, okay, uh, that it's being managed or, or, or poorly handled either by the, 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 the structure provider or by uh, the youth under that structural um, situation. And then um, low social demand. So do you have a lone wolf where, you know, he's not going to be getting glory or she's not going to be getting glory for their actions? For example, like I mentioned earlier, jumping into a gang often involves, you know, we have these random things where somebody will walk up and just knock somebody in the head from behind. And the person goes down to the ground as a, as a component of uh, uh, getting jumped into a gang, as it were. Um, so that's a, but that would be a high social demand. A low social demand would be somebody who's just kind of, they're frustrated, they're at their wit's end, they don't care. Um, Kip Kinkle was a good example of a low social demand youth who took out his aggression on, on innocent folks. Uh, I mentioned gang street life, uh, drug dealing is a part of that as well. So you know, how often do we hear about drug deals go bad, uh, where uh, money exchange issues become a problem, um, or just whatever becomes a problem, territory, turf. Uh, it just goes bad, and so violence is a quick solution to those. Um, or and, and more, most likely, they happen while committing a crime. So maybe burglary uh, is is the actual crime that was initiated, but lo and behold, somebody's home, and now and, and violence is engaged in as a reactive uh, response to that. <clears throat> so then, um, then. Um, and, D, now, who are the likely participants? Oh, excuse me, what are the likely, not who? <laughs> what are the likely precipitants of aggression and violence? And check all that apply. Okay, school failure, discipline, just resistance to authority, whether it's being applied by you know, the police or uh, PO or mom or dad, uh, older brother or sister, who knows, or school personnel. Um, uh, getting away with it, being able to avoid detection. And I'll, um, this is, you know, this is really also tapping into some of those more nefarious criminogenic attitudes that uh, if I can get away with it and do it, I'm going to do it. And um, um, or, you know, to stand up for themselves in the face of public humiliation, um, saving face, as it were, and, or, or uh, retribution for that. Um, pure loss or rejection, other relationship rejection, sometimes loss of a girlfriend, for example, might be a precipitant for that. Um, or boyfriend, particularly if it's uh, with somebody you know and that you have some level of conflict with um, because of that, uh, or do they feel threatened? Uh, is there conflict? There's this kind of peer gang conflicts or community conflicts, uh, maybe turf wars and these kinds of things. And then uh, also being a victim of bully or violence, uh, thrill-seeking behavior in and of itself. So just getting bored and wanting to do something uh, can be a precipitant in and of itself. Um, the desire to dominate others, 
family discipline, recent family discipline, particularly if the child I mean, or the adolescent is engaging in behavior problems and the family's coming down head on, heavy on them. So now they're the authority figure, they're, they're giving discipline, the child's not reacting to it well. Um, and there's a, maybe there's a high level of conflict in the family, uh, legal problems, out of home placement, as mentioned earlier, um, having a mental health crisis of their own. So they are in, uh, they're flooded themselves. They're having high levels of anxiety. They can't regulate it well. Um, their, uh, their locus of control is highly external. They feel like they're being victimized. Uh, and maybe they are being victimized, but it expands um, to kind of a belief that this is happening to them in the world all the time. Um, major life changes such as moving, um, job loss and family, uh, you know, all the stuff that we're dealing with now, COVID restrictions and so on. Um, the substance use is a risk factor as well. And then weapon availability and other disruptions that maybe are on this list. So quite a, th quite a list of uh, possible persistent precipitants to consider um, for the pathway to violence. And then what do they get out of it? What are the reinforcers for them acting on this? Okay, well, it's uh, consistent with their pro-violent attitude. Their peers endorse the violent activity. The family might endorse it. Uh, or the family enables it by making excuses so that accountability for the youth is easily dodged. Um, and this might be something that you will see in either uh, you know, highly under understructured families or families that are have some are criminogenic themselves where they endorse the violence and they make excuses for the child so they don't have to uh, stand uh, accountability. Um, professionals make excuses as well. Sometimes professionals can uh, um, uh, justify a child's behavior as, as being reactive or response to trauma when perhaps it's more complicated than that. And, you know, some just because you've been uh, traumatized does not mean that you don't necessarily develop criminogenic beliefs, okay? And one doesn't, doesn't have to lead to the other, and does not really uh, link that way. But having high risk taking behaviors and, um, and attitudes and beliefs that put you in confrontational situations on a regular basis is going to put you at risk for things like trauma and um, so on. So uh, clearly having minimal consequences is a reinforcer, avoiding responsibility. So if they, they were able to basically dodge getting caught, that's a reinforcer. Um, aggression is paid off. It's paid off in status, perhaps. It's paid off in money. It's paid off in um, safety because they're not being picked. Um, or maybe they earn privileges, such as kind of gain membership and these kinds of things. Okay? They earn respect in their community. This is just something you often see with disenfranchised communities where violence is highly tolerated and endorsed, where, you know, respect. You have a gun, you have a gun because they respect you more, something that you may often hear with folks who have um, engaged in, in this uh, lifestyle uh, as youth and adults. Uh, and just the thr thrill of it. Sometimes it's exciting to do hairy things and get away with it. And uh, for thrill seekers, you know, you're always looking for higher levels of stimulation because you get habituated to those lower levels. And so escalation becomes easier and easier over time. So pulling all these things together, okay, we begin to, so why, why have we done all this? We are being asked to make an estimation of violence risk, okay? So, the, um, so what is their overall risk of violence? in your opinion, based on your ranking of zero, one, or two across those appropriate risk factors or, um, or um, um, uh, kind of a pathways to violence factors, uh, your, is it escalating? Is it stable? Is it de-escalating? Does it not apply? Is it, you're pulling all this together, and hopefully you have now a window, kind of an image of, not more than a window, really, more of a spherical look at what's going on with this child's life. And you may the potential for risk is, okay? So low violence risk would be there are few risk factors that are present and none that are related to past violent behavior, such as serious injury, or an immediate risk of violence. In these cases, no further inquiry or violence risk or special preventative actions are encouraged unless circumstances change. Okay. So then, we like that one. Hopefully that's the one we get a lot of. Uh, but then there's the moderate risk factor, and, and for this one, there are multiple risk factors that are present, whether through the individual, family, school, community, legal, okay? Uh, but none that relate to an immediate risk. Okay, so they're there, immediate, uh, immediate risk of violence. To the extent that risk factors are present, they reflect his problem or aggressive behavior that is common to children and adolescents, 
okay? Uh, particularly if they come from more at-risk disenfranchised communities, but they do not include serious injury or other form of violent behavior, okay? So uh, they relate to, they don't relate to immediate risk, maybe they've happened in the past, but they don't include serious injury or other form of violent behavior. If the use of the past, then there must be evidence of past violence do not apply in the current context. Evidence for patient you're getting through uh, their family, school, schools, therapists, you know, community workers, probation officers or counselors, data that you've, uh, you're in less of the kind of critical escalations on some of those factors. Uh, and then, um, um, and but because of this group, because they are still, you know, they're still at risk, you do, you may consider wanting, wanting to do a follow-up of investigation or evaluation of So then the high risk, high violence risk is there are numerous risk factors that are present. These youth usually have a risk, a mix of risk factors that apply both to past and current problems, including a history of frequent aggression behavior and a history of isolated violent behavior. To present an imminent risk of renewed violence. In some cases, there may be very few risk factors, but there is evidence of imminent risk because the ones that are there are serious, okay? As long as the youth is stable and can be managed by guardians and the community placement appears viable. So now you can see we're starting to really get into more of a hands-on interventions with these kids, okay? Um, when we're talking about placement and staying in the community versus removal, okay? Give priority to gathering additional information, additional information and providing those clients uh, close monitoring so they don't slip. Okay, uh, take preventative action as you deem necessary. If the situation deteriorates, be prepared to warn potential victims and to detain the at-risk youth. Okay, so you see we cross the threshold there. Detention becomes a part of the conversation. Uh, the same so very very high risk violence use is, is the same consideration for for high violence risk apply except that the youth is not stable and cannot be managed by guardians in the community. Further deterioration of function appears likely, the violent behavior appears imminent, and the youth requires imminent detention or containment. Potential victims will need to be warned in most cases. So depending on what you just establish, if you're a high risk or very high risk, uh, you then summarize this. There's no, so, so if there is a threat to harm and you think they're high or, high or very high risk, is there a victim? Or do they just say, I'm gonna go blow people off the park, okay? Where, that's, that's not identifiable victim, okay? But if they have a victim, who are they? Now, uh, if harm does not appear likely and imminent, then skip this and go to their kind of self, the next section I'll hit on a second. But if it like is likely and imminent, then what's the method? And do they have access to the means of harm? Um, access to the means of harm is unlikely. Um, access to the intended victim or access to the intended victim is unlikely, okay? So duty to warn, protect appears warranted or does not based on kind of your summary of these, okay? So uh, what's your duty to intervene, okay? Threat to harm, duty to intervene. Is it current or past? This is um, um, uh, under the risk of the student now or the child. Uh, current or past depression, current or past suicidal behavior. This is important because it, 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 it speaks to dysregulation of, of the uh, affective situation that they're in. Uh, trauma disorder. Okay. Are they reactive? Uh, poor reality testing, substance abuse. Uh, you know, I work, I work with kids who their violence always seems to occur when they're drunk. Okay. Uh, poor peer relations, uh, problems managing anger, and so on. Okay. So threats to harm to self. Duty to intervene continue. Um, does the um, life are the life stressors we, we reviewed escalating, like we clicked on, uh, clicked off rather, checked off. Uh, are they currently under high levels of stress? Are they talking about committing active violence? And are their coping skills and resources adequate, inadequate? Kind of what's your estimation of that? Okay, so the overall pattern is, is it high, are you assessing them as high risk, moderate or low? Okay, or not at all, not applicable. And uh, do you intervene and you know, make notes regarding who you think you need to intervene with, who needs to be informed? Okay, okay. so then, so by the time you get to this level, you should have a very good idea of the escalating, de-escalating, stable, over. Um, yes. mm, no, okay, cancel that. Um, but then what do we do, okay? So you should you should have a high level of confidence for your estimate of risk at this point, okay? So intervention, intervention options include some individual ones, focus on decreasing stress, 
uh, reassure and support the youth that there's other options, these problem solving and reality testing, uh, some different types of coping skills regarding that, and engaging in a no harm contract. Um, fat, that's for the individual. For family home, alert the parent or guardians of the risk level, and particularly if uh, they're supportive, uh, encourage an acceptance, uh, acceptance of, the of the child and what they're going through, strategize safety options, increase supervision, family safety watch, particularly if they're a potential target, safety proof the home by removing sharps and guns and all these types of things, and provide information about safety resources that are available. So for school uh, intervention options is you wanna encourage the school to increase supervision, uh, help them focus on teaching new coping skills that are appropriate for the, that environment in particular. I have available school psychologists or school counselors or behavior support specialists to offer de-escalation um, and support at school. Um, um, disciplinary action, if necessary, uh, get them out of the risk, high risk environment at the school if that's where it is, send them home if you need to. Uh, decrease class load, perhaps have them do independent studies or other alternative school programs um, or specialized classes if appropriate. And then for uh, community options, consider uh, kind of further psychological evaluation, particularly if you want them to maintain engagement. Uh, if medication is necessary, consider psychiatric uh, evaluation, possible hospitalization. Again, increase supervision uh, in the community, uh, particularly if they're involved in the legal system. Um, teach new skills, do uh, alcohol and drug evaluation, because that may be an active component of their risk level, um, and referral is appropriate. And notify the authorities, uh, particularly if they're high, very high risk, and you have an, uh, a named entity that they're going to uh, go for, um, and so on. So then, what is their likely compliance uh, for, uh, of their interventions? Is it um, unlikely, likely, and unable to do this point? And you build that into your recommendations. Okay. And then, what are the responsibilities for various entities? Some of these will be shared orally and in writing with the following people. So what are, what are, what's my summary and who am I sharing it with? Family, a parent, guardian, or other, um, school personnel. As you can see here, there's a whole variety of those. I'm sorry, time, so I'm kind of going a little faster. Um, and the community, does the, do the authorities need to know? The police or the sheriff or the juvenile court folks? They often will have pre-adjudication uh, programs that may be appropriate to refer to, um, or an evaluation specialist or counselor or a hospital. And then if you're gonna have another reevaluation date, I uh, recommend that you list that here and, um, um, and why you wanna do that. And this is gonna be based on your level of risk estimate and who you are and then a supervisor consultant. So feel free to use this outline. I'm sorry that I did not have the, uh, I had made a mistake in the slides I sent. Um, um, so I didn't have actually data to show you of what a profile looks like. I will provide those to be posted on the internet though, uh, for the web for this. Thank you for your time today. Um, hopefully, we're always learning in our endeavors as professionals and, and with who we work. And um, uh, I hope everybody has a good day. Take care. <clears throat>